नमस्ते सो वाइटल रेफर्स टू द एनर्जी फीडर सिस्टम ऑफ द बॉडी माइंड ऑल द अदर एक्टिविटीज द स्पिरिचुअल इट सेल्फ इट इज द एनर्जी जस्ट लाइक अ कार हैज अ बॉडी देन इट हैज अ फ्यूल इट हैज द ड्राइवर एंड इट हैज द ओनर ऑफ द कार सो टू we have a human body the body is the vehicle the fuel is the vital energy without which you can't run the car in any direction the mind and the buddhi are the one who is holding the steering wheel and the owner is the soul at whose direction the car is supposed to run and the driver is supposed to take the car so when we refer to the vital we are referring primarily to the energy system without which really speaking nothing is really possible it gives the dynamic push to the nature in every direction so even before we speak about equanimity it is important to understand where does the vital get its own energy from so normally of course this world is a dance of energy and all around us uh, is basically energy which is dancing in space becoming matter but we don't have a direct access to this energy ordinarily we have access because we are like closed containers so we have access also very indirectly so one source of energy is of course the food we eat through matter energy becomes matter and matter becomes energy again back into our system now depending on the type of matter type of food we eat different kinds of energy systems become active in us for instance we have the tamasic energy when we take uh, rotten food stale food refrigerated food fast food all kinds of food so it provides a different kind of an energy system and it's not just about the food but who prepares it in what consciousness do we eat so all this starts creating a kind of burden on our vital being then we have the other source of a kind of food energy which is rajasic which is primarily non veg food very spicy food etc it gives the body a kick start it gives energy boost like again carbohydrates etc but it is an energy which is of a very mixed kind it over a period of time throws a lot of uh, uh, things which can adversely impact the car itself and then there are sattvic foods like fruits primarily foods prepared with a good consciousness vegetarian food all this uh, creates a very nice sattvic energy and it becomes easier to practice not only equanimity but to actually vital is the most important source one cannot do yoga one cannot lead a life without the vital energy but it tends to refine it it makes it better and better and more effective so this is one part we have to understand about the energy feeder system then apart from food the other source of energy is the world around us so world around us it's steaming with vibrations and each human being each object is a container a receiver and transmitter of energy so it depends upon the type of people we come in contact with not only in terms of physical chatting and communicating but also the people with whom we socialize even on the phone the people we speak to the people we spend time with we chat with so all these energies each one is like receiving containing and transmitting energy so we enter into something known as vital interchange and uh, which is one of the most harmful sources Uh, or affliction it's like on one side we want to practice equanimity refinement and uplifting of these energies upward on the other side we are constantly budding in it so what happens after a time the system tends to break down now in that there are some with whom we may engage in an intense vital interchange that's what normally human beings call as love you know falling in love but more often than not it is a vital interchange and uh based on surface attractions excitement passions and all this creates another kind of uh, energy overload into the system why i'm saying is that if the energy is more refined lighter the vital is more refined lighter it's much more easier to practice equanimity than if it is heavy burdened then it's far more difficult so 
the principal advice uh, or even before that so this is another kind of you know energy system that we are driven by vital interchange with the world around us then a third source of energy is of course the spiritual and the higher energy system and if we can start drawing energy from there directly through our contact with the divine then automatically the nature of energy that comes is far more balanced harmonious beautiful rhythmic and it tends to give health to the body and automatically uh, because it's more refined equanimity becomes far easier to practice so why do we want to practice equanimity to start with we want to practice equanimity because the vital can carry our entire being into storms turbulent you know these passions they are like they can carry us far far away uh and much later one realizes that one has actually entered into a whirlpool you know there is a phrase in the gita when arjuna says that but it's very difficult he says yes these things can carry the mind of man even of a sage very far away and even to a point where one can completely forget the goal lose sight of the goal and therefore fall so the first practice that one has to do is before uh anything else basic practice is to learn to detach at least a part of a consciousness from what is happening in this entire range it's not a it's a package it's not like from the higher vital i'll detach but keep attached to the mind and lower vital no in fact that is very dangerous so we have to it's an entire package to learn to separate the consciousness the purusha the witness the being normally it is by a higher part of the mind later on it can deepen into the soul from the movements of nature so we need to be able to observe our nature what's happening within it and all the turbulences all the storms the origin the motive the direction towards which things are flowing it automatically gives us a tremendous degree of control over the vital this is a basic practice and the gita enjoins this as the first fundamental practice the mother Uh, makes it uh, very simple and very clear shubhendra also speaks about it the first thing to do is to learn to separate the purusha from prakriti so the mother speaks of stepping back and by stepping back she means that basically one has to learn to step back from the whirl of nature and all that is going on and see what is really of value and importance and then one sees that actually there are very few things of real value so she says that don't invest energy and tie yourself through a thousand bonds on things which are of a transient nature because if we do that they will pull us very badly and when they pull us very badly the whole ship rocks so instead of that the energy should be turned inward the consciousness should be turned inward and upward and we should try to focus our mind on the eternal and by that is meant that whatever we are doing whether it be engaging in normal activities ordinary activities of life every day activities whether it be work whether it be relationships whether it be anything we are pursuing we should try to look for the eternal values try to turn it towards something which is more eternal and enduring uh, rather than towards the immediate transient quick gains because when we do that then obviously we are carried away for ex- for example if a person is living for pleasure whether it be pleasure of food or any kind of pleasure money you know that it that pleasure brings then we are operating in a mode which is an extremely stormy our ship will be carried through or our car will be carried on very bumpy roads through lot of storms and turbulent things and it will be very difficult to control it let alone practice equanimity so second thing that she advises is to exercise or discipline the vital by exercising a luminous satvik governance of life that the mind can provide so it's not like whatever the vital feels like the heart feels and we just flow with it lot of people have that ki you know i am flowing with my heart and going by they use the word that myself and you know such terms are used but that self is nothing but the desire and the ego self which is on the surface so we are driven by the vital and we think that basically it's me and uh, there is a term which is used um, spontaneously you know whichever way life is taking me now this is very dangerous because this spontaneity is the spontaneity of the animal creation and we know that animal creation for all its beauty and 
uh, magnificence, it's not a self-evolving creation. It's a static creation. Animals are where they are. They are beautiful, but they stay where they are. Whereas man is meant for evolution. So it's so important not to rush at the first impulse. Every little impulse that comes, every little call, every little suggestion and we rush in that direction. So to exercise on it a control by first separating, then exercising, putting the thinking mind and the discerning mind, it should start looking at that action. If I follow this trail, where is it going to lead me? This is a very simple practice and a very simple exercise. And all of us uh, have fortunately the faculty of reason and the discerning intellect. It doesn't require a very deep engagement with yoga, but just to become reasonable human beings so that we control things, regulate things and don't just, uh, we are not driven just by impulse of the moment. It means engaging with every activity of life. But knowing what is called in the Gita as Desh Kal Patra. This is the right moment to do things. This is the right place to do things. And this is the right way to do things, to cultivate it within ourselves. So it's kind of regulating our life. And in that regulation, one very simple practice, but very, very far-reaching, of far-reaching significance is that just to maintain regularity and discipline. It's a very elementary practice. But if we can do this, it will automatically bring our vital under a great degree of control. Try just one week. Following a particular routine, simply of waking up and you see that just to do that, to wake up and get ready, if you fix a time that I am going to get up, it, it's not to become rigid about it, but if that I'll wake up at a particular time and get ready by this time. See what challenges come in the way. And then you will see that if you are able to do it for a week, basically you have automatically conquered, governed a lot of things which were extraneous and unimportant. Take a simple example that if one has to wake up at a time, fixed time, let's say 6 o'clock, one decides to wake up. Maybe I am saying too early, uh, I should say 10 o'clock, but well, <laughs> let's say that you want to wake up at 6 o'clock. So then what, what one has to do? One will realize on one's own that at night I am just unnecessarily chatting or even spending time whiling it away on TV, which is really not required. It's not necessary, then you know one slowly starts adjusting everything to wake up at 6 o'clock. Now when one wakes up at 6 o'clock, then life is also led like that. So it's very good to make a little routine. It should not be a very rigid routine. I'm not saying that 6, you will wake up by the alarm and not date 6.15. It's okay. But by and large, try to wake up at a fixed time. Make a routine. And even if there is no such compulsion of work, Bring in an inner compulsion. See, one of the problem of this work from home, which is a wonderful thing at one level, but it's one big disadvantage is made our life parts even more unruly because there is no discipline required really. You don't have to go. But it's a good thing. I'm again saying that it has many advantages in many ways. But at the same time, if we can ourselves make a routine, okay, I'll get up at this time, I'll do this work, I'll read at this point of time. I'll do some exercises. Just follow it for one week and you'll see what it means to really control the vital. Automatically. We don't have to do many things. So in the ashram context, we see that this is one of the simplest ways. So in the ashram, it's very surprising. You know, I was very happy, happily surprised that um, because coming from the military background, uh, having served in Air Force, you know, if you had the time that 7.30, you have to reach office at your workplace, hospital. You have to be at 7.30. You can be at 7.29, but not 7.31. So it trained so beautifully the consciousness. So when I came to ashram, but generally that's not the case in many government you know, departments and private practice. But here I was so happy in ashram. If you have a department opening at 8, it means 8. In fact, people will come five minutes early. They will start arranging. Somebody will clean the place. And it's such a beautiful training. Similarly, there is regularity. It's not like, okay, today I'm just taking leave and off. So people automatically start basically disciplining the vital. And then the third thing which is necessary, and that is so that the heavy energies of the vital that we pick up from all around the world, one cannot avoid when one is living in the world, one is interacting with people, one is eating all kinds of food. It's not always possible to regulate it. 
but one thing which one can always do is to engage in vigorous physical exercise if nothing else spotting jog on the jog spotting so this another thing we see mother has ingrained in the ashram ethos of course the physical exercise has many other deeper um, reasons why it has been there but one thing which it does is regulates the vital automatically many energies of passion anger excitement they are thrown away it's a known thing especially if one engages in a sport it is a very good means to really wash away these energies swimming and as i said if nothing is there just a brisk walk or um, you know on the jog uh, on the spot jogging so these are simple ways by which our energies can become lighter and much more manageable she gives this example that while you can tame a wild horse you cannot tame a tiger so you know we should change these energies from the tiger mode to the wild horse and then to the tamed horse so while wild horses have tremendous energy and can be very useful when you train them and they are trainable but a tiger you just cannot train so most of these energies uh tiger is basically representing that kind of stealth lust greed all these things are there which come together so by exercising a certain amount of mental control control of reason discerning intellect another thing which is very helpful in this is uh along with exercise etc is to basically uh, just like sports is very helpful to cultivate art music poetry they really are a perfect education they are best means of refining the vital so of course by art pick up some hobby it could be just you know digital drawing or uh, just doodling it doesn't matter it's not for exhibition it's not for performing something if sculpture that's something very very good if one picks up uh, you know one can always get some plasticine and start doing things with that in a very simple way learn some hobbies poetry is another excellent way of disciplining or rather refining the vital because otherwise we just try to practice equanimity it doesn't really uh, help because it's tremendous energy you can't tame it you can't start you know one is carried in its whirlpool so first the wild horse must be tamed and trained before you can become its master otherwise try taming a it's like a bull it will throw you away it will need tremendous strength to do that so poetry is another very good way so engaging with poetry through literature through writing poetry through poetic expressions and uh, you know one tends to refine it then art poetry and music listening to music it tends to bring a kind of harmony and rhythm in the vital here we use mother's music savitri music sunil das music but you know indian music with ragas and all these these are excellent means of uh, bringing a kind of poise and rhythm in the vital so this is another uh, very simple helpful way and of course as i keep saying turn life into an art turn life into a music turn life into a poetry turn life into a worship if we can do that then it's excellent and another fifth practice that one has to do is to exercise a certain mastery over desire not to be swayed by any and every desire it it is just to make oneself a human being before one can talk about becoming even engaging in yoga or anything like that but a human being is distinguished by that the hallmark between a inferior and a true humanity is that an inferior uh, humanity is driven by desire wherever the desire takes us one goes whereas a higher humanity exercises this you know it draws the rain and exercises a control it's not that one has to abandon desire right away and you know shun desire that's a very difficult i mean that will come to next but even as a human being bring moderation if you need uh, maybe if we really look at it let's get take, take that example one goes to amazon now amazon has one advantage that it brings things to doorsteps but have you noticed that there are so many options it can put one into that market space for hours i know people who just get there and get lost of course even in physical market the same thing applies but at least to go to physical market and all is <laughs> but amazon so one is seeing all the options seeing choosing and after a long time one makes a choice then chalo ye bhi le lo wo bhi le lo 
a simple practice very very simple i have honestly tried that in my life and it works wonders what do i really need and if i need something fine but not an extra thing which you don't need but it may be a little more difficult but at least okay let me take let's say if i need one t-shirt okay i will buy two but not like seven eight they are lying one pair of sandals another and third pair and fourth pair so when we are not driven by the desire mode and we start exercising a reasonable control over it it becomes far more easy to practice equanimity excessive ambition one should try to practice excellence in life urge for progress should be there but then ambition is always comparing oneself with somebody else and then there is no peace without peace there is no practice of equanimity i know of a it very you know it's a true story of somebody who was the um ceo of a big uh, company and he once came to me you know was going through depression chronic depression uh, a big achiever so i asked him what happened so he d- described all the things that were going on in the company and then he said somebody advised me that take a break take a holiday so i took a break and took a holiday very nice resort and but after 3 days my depression worsened So I said, "What happened?" He said, "First two days it was very nice. I felt very peaceful and calm. Then there was a tennis court there, so I went to play tennis. But when I started playing tennis, the person with whom I was playing, I started losing. So I got into this mode that I must win the game. Now there was no real game. There was no necessity to think like that. He was relaxing on a holiday, but his mind got into this ambition mode of competing with somebody. It took away the peace." so to moderate the ambition turn it into pursuit of excellence do very well in whatever one is doing with an eye on perfection detail as a dedication to you know with an urge of progress but when we do it in ambition mode we are already doing to try to achieve something outer or we are competing with somebody and that's never a healthy thing these are the things within the human range that one can do if one can do that life would be beautiful then comes the practices which come through yoga now in those practices we have one basic practices to call peace the vital is by its nature stormy turbulent higher vital emotions love and how soon this love turns into hatred mixes into things like jealousy spirit of dominating possessiveness all this enters and the saddest the most beautiful stories of life and the saddest stories of life are both connected with love see love gives joy it uplifts us such a beautiful thing to happen the most beautiful thing ever to happen in life is not a promotion it's not a pay raise it's not uh, you know any of those thing but to find love and the worst thing that can ap- ever happen is in life is to see that love slowly destroy or get disintegrated change into something which is its very opposite so why does that happen so these energies when they awaken within us they invade the whole system that's why you see the old advice was don't get into love when you know youngsters ever naturally with the rush of adolescent people felt love of course it's not love in the deepest sense but some semblance of love some touch of love and what was the advice no 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 first think about your career first think about doing your job well so what used to happen people would suppress this emotional energy and start engaging with the mind and once they got into the job then ambition then so what became of this energy it was suppressed and there was a thought mind thought mind no but rather a mind which was engaging in success and a passion driven humanity which forgot love then people got married their children but they didn't know how to love so while this energy will awaken at some point of time we have to learn how to love truly and love properly instead of not loving it's to love properly and to love truly that itself is a whole yoga and mother gives a very simple advice very simple very difficult to practice yet if we really want to turn this most powerful energy towards its own highest possibility 
then one has to learn to love unselfishly. That's the minimum. Not to love for any personal gain, advantage, what I can get out of that person or to just satisfy pleasures and these appetites. No. Just to learn to love beautifully in a true way, in a way which, you know, is really worthy and noble of a human being. Not to love like an animal. Not to love like a Rakshasa and Asura who want their own, who want to possess, dominate, extract their own, uh, what they can get and then just completely abandon, leave. That is very crude forms of love. But make love something noble, beautiful, worthy of our humanity. And how to do it? The one step formula is to learn to love unselfishly. To give love, not to ask, demand, expect, but give love. If you love somebody, give love. That doesn't mean bowing down to the caprices of the person. It never means that. It doesn't mean that, okay, if the person liked that story of Isu and Jacob, that he said, you give me your, uh, you know, uh, soul and I'll give you my mass of porridge, my pot of porridge. And this fellow was very hungry and he said, okay, I'll take that exchange. Love doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that one will do anything and everything. But whatever you are doing, in fact, love is not just about between human beings. It's in the whole creation. Dealing with uh, physical objects in one space, dealing with animals, trees, every human being, every human relation. Bring in that vibration of true deep love, but do it without any expectation and selfishness. Just if one can do it, it's a yoga, a tapasya in its own right. So a natural question comes that, well, but we all need love. How can I give? I need to get love. And there are then all about rightful expectations, wrong expectations. Very simply, yes, if one remains a closed container, then you have a give and take of love. You give me love, I'll give you love. Better version of that same exchange is, I'll give you love, but you give me love. So there are two levels at which most human beings operate. One is, you give me love, then I will give you love. That is the lower version. The higher version is within that same range. The other side of the coin is, I'll give you love, but you give me love. But there is a still greater version. That I give love because I love. And that is only possible when this energy of love gets linked with its source. Higher source. And that is the beauty of one of the... Uh, not that one loves the divine for this purpose or any purpose. But that is the beauty of bhakti. When we turn to the divine and turn our higher vital towards the divine, two things happen. One is that an inexhaustible, infinite source of love opens before us. So much that our human container cannot contain. It tends to spill in all directions initially because it's a tremendous divine influx that takes place. Love is the most direct and straight movements towards the divine. The mind goes through mazes of doubt, error, knowledge, doubt, error, knowledge, doubt, error, knowledge. And that knowledge is actually in ignorance because it's never fully convinced. So mind keeps moving in that direction, most of the time horizontal with little, little step upward. But with, when it comes to love, directly it can turn within to the source and get connected very fast. It's the crowning movement, the shortest road, the swiftest road to the divine. And when it comes in contact with the divine, then it regains its original uh, beauty, its original purity, its original delight. So we have that story of Kubja in the Bhagavatam, where this is a lady who is uh, ugly and she is crooked at physically, not inwardly which is really worse much worse but more difficult though less worse is the physical physically if one is you know deformed but inner deformation is really ugly so here is Kubja and when Sri Krishna goes to Mathura because Kans has invited him with dubious plans she also wants to see him but she doesn't want to come forward because she is ugly and yet Shri Krishna's glance falls on her and he calls her near. And when she comes and the story goes that he touches her and she becomes a beautiful maiden. 
Now, what is this? This is the transformation that takes place. When all our deformed energies, perverted energies come in contact with the divine. So the secret really lies in turning these energies and touching them with the divine. So how do we touch them through the divine? There is a door through which we have to go. And the door is the psychic door. In fact, the touch of the psychic automatically brings in any energy, be it the will, be it the thought, be it the energy of love, everything, it automatically makes the crooked straight. It has this action. So the moment one touches the psychic and if there is ambition in the being, it turns it into a means of service to the divine. It automatically gets changed. So it changes into seva. The much celebrated and advice which is given by great sages, that seva, by seva, we were told in Hindi, there was a saying when we were children, we are told, seva karoge to meva milega. Of course, one doesn't do seva for getting meva, but the joy of seva, the joy of service, it's something which is often missing in today's times. And one reason is because everything is available at push button. And second is life has become so scattered. That way in commune, the advantages you can learn this automatically. So in commune, you are not just serving a little family. But it's a whole large family. Much larger family in which each is a part of the other and each one is a part of yourself. So this practice of seva and above all you are serving the divine. So this practice of spirit of service automatically brings in the vital a state of humility, a state of refinement, a state of upliftment. Because when we serve the divine, literally the divine lifts us up. For worship lifts the worshipper from the dust in which he is fallen and takes him towards his own being. So seva, the spirit of service, love, entering the psychic door automatically becomes refined and it changes into, it begins to love truth and good and beauty because these are the movements of the psychic. So when you love somebody and there is the psychic touch in it, you will always want that person's good. It is regardless of your own selfish interest. It may not be good for you, but yet you would love that person so that his good or her good happens. There is a very beautiful uh, poem of Sri Of course, every poem is beautiful. But one of them, which is uh, titled Ulupi. So Ulupi is a northeastern princess. So you see how they had integrated all these beautiful northeast, west, um, down south and up. So this northeastern princess, uh, when Arjuna during his vanvas goes there and he falls in love and marries her. Now when he marries her, he also knows he has to come back and she also knows he has to come back. So she is wedded to none else but Arjuna and she wants to be with him. She has a child who she is carrying in the womb. But Sri describes that night when Ulupi tells Arjuna that I know great warrior that you are not meant only for this. You are meant for great mighty deeds which await you. And I set you free. You go and accomplish that for which you have come. This high point, this sacrifice of love, because of which Arjuna ultimately, I mean, she could have told him that, you know, you are now married to me, you stay here. And she had convinced him, that's how, that you see, Draupadi is not just your wife, she is, you know, right now she is not with you, she is meant to be with you this day, so everything is justified. She could have just asked him or even told him that, take me along with you. But she sacrifices because she knows that there is something much greater good. The greater good for Arjuna is not in being domesticated. The greater good of Arjuna is in, uh, you know, um, going through the crash of wheels on the battlefield, which awaits him, that battle which will change the destiny of India and humanity. So this aspect of giving oneself, sacrifice, and rising through these flames towards a greater and greater purity, to consider what is truly good, that's a movement of love. Love will never want something which is, uh, you know, bad or ugly for oneself. It will see what is truly good. Then it's, it moves towards truth. This touch of the psyche starts all the noblest and highest impulses. They will not be those covers of deceptions. 
it will show oneself that look here you know this is something which is not really a true movement so one begins to automatically start aligning them aligning to truth is a very very difficult thing because it requires an unflinching courage tremendous courage the first natural impulse of human beings is to avoid problems so yet love this energy touched by the psychic tends to move towards its own truth and then of course truth good and beauty so in everything there must be beauty so this touch of beauty is the best thing that can ever happen in any domain if one wants to refine and the last thing is harmony so love automatically seeks harmony the higher vital a love which creates chaos disorder disintegration divisions fights quarrels is not love obviously it's something very distorted or it's love but which has entered into very rakshasic and asuric form but true love is something which creates bonds beautiful bonds harmonious bonds it unites brings things together people together rather than fights and you know trying to occupy space and dominate and control so in proportion as we do it in proportion as we connect this energy of love with the divine through bhakti through seva by turning inwards by learning to separate from the surface movements of nature by not being driven by the ego and the desire self by moderate leading a life of moderation balance regulation discipline slowly we begin to reach a point where the surface movements of love the storms of the higher vital the storms that would drive us away they do not afflict us they touch the surface and pass away because we are now living in a deeper state and that is the royal road to equanimity otherwise people often mistake equanimity for uh, you know indifference a kind of detachment to everybody uh, well maybe that is required at some stage when man is very crude but sometimes when we do that we lose the possibility of love itself so there are ascetics who turn away from life who turn away from relationships who turn away from love because they regard it as a source of bondage they say karma is bondage love is bondage but the yogi turns karma into a service of the divine he turns all his manifold relations with this world into a means of exploring finding worshiping and loving the divine in humanity so these are the steps through which we can refine the vital bring in their peace and equanimity quietude and instead of being driven by the surface storms and turbulences we can bring into it the rectitude of the spirit the rhythm and harmony of a higher consciousness the touch of god upon our human life this is the little background now if there are questions you are most welcome thank you so much arunka there is a question on the chat which uh, says that generosity you talked about generosity and giving oneself completely and at the same time self protection having boundaries to uh, preserve one's dignity and not being misused so how does one define or distinguish between them generosity and also self so that's yes so generosity is of course a different movement altogether and the, uh, generosity means that well you uh, let's say for instance a movement of forgiveness now that's a generosity where one has been a uh, generous enough to forgive something which has happened but then if let's say that a wrong has happened to somebody i mean in the sense somebody has cheated you and um, i am not talking specifically with relation to love okay so now one option is that you forgive the person and let go while this may be okay for you but it's not okay for the person you see what we have really given him a blanket sanction to continue with his way of life so sometimes uh, it's beautifully put justice is the right arm of love because it is the one which is going to help him tomorrow it should not be done with hatred and anger and all that 
but it is the right arm of love because it helps the person to understand at one point shirbindu says that okay uh, people who say that you know like non violence i'm not going to react i'm not going to raise arms and they want to keep their hands clean but then he says sometimes it's a greater compassion to stay the slayer and push him back it's good for him otherwise you are just letting him see that's how crime and violence is encouraged in the society the only thing is with generosity that you don't hold grudges against the person you don't hold inside you understand that this is his nature and that nature is uh, horrifying nature you have come in contact with it you have come aware of it come out of that it's not about you know uh, i'll come to self giving just a moment later come out of that definitely when you have discovered something like that but at the same time sometimes if you feel moved well it is good to you know if necessary take him to a point where he understand that well this is not a way of life this is something which is self destructive mode of living and even for him it's not good so this is one part of it self giving doesn't mean to give in give in to the desires and fancies of another person self giving never means that self giving is never to be you know forced into doing something which your soul uh, does not agree or accept because that is the actual source from where you have to take the okay self giving is always to the beautiful to the truth to to the divine within a human being let's take for example in a in a case where there is marriage which is where one wants to have physical relation one is legally okay with it i mean legal law used to allow it i think they are now enacting a law you one may actually love the person and um, yet deep within there is a change that has undergone one feels that no i should not engage in this activity which in which one has to uplift oneself more and more upward now what does one do in such a case one can do either if one gives in one gives in with this complete thought that well it is the divine to whom i am at this point of time to that tremendous act of love with that state of self giving and yes it can bring in oneself with the contact with the higher consciousness it has happened with people but at the same time one can say that no i don't think that it is agreeing with my soul i cannot engage in this so self giving never means giving one soul away and that's what i meant by the mass of you know pot of porridge for which one exchanges the soul self giving is never that is one soul has to be given away uh, at the mercy of uh, you know all kinds of forces in the world because it'll create a great disturbance and imbalance at the same time there have been instances like that and uh, yet when it has been done with tremendous love it has brought its own height so in india if you see the five women who are regarded as panch kanyas in the morning prata smarniya one of them is mandotri she gave herself to the demon king unreservedly but at the same time she always counseled him for the right and the light always always she advised him to follow the path of dharma and yet she gave she stood by his side never abandoned him and for this reason mandodri is regarded as one of the five uh, legendary women whose remembering whose name is supposed to be uh, very auspicious and strengthening to a human being so um, it depends now of course if one feels like drawing boundaries it depends you know what it what one means by love so if there is a true love then one gives oneself with a joy and spontaneity but if you feel that in this giving you are being misused you are being uh, you know deceived you are just being taken advantage of certainly one has a right to withdraw that giving self giving with completeness absoluteness and for all eternity is only and only for the divine it's not like a termless self giving that one has signed a check that from today i have give, given yourself for good so all events in human life in the human drama unfold in time and space the only termless termless thing is the eternal so maybe at a given point of time love blossomed so beautifully that one gave oneself fully 
But just as even with divine, Shrubindo says you are free at each moment to even recall your self-giving and go through the spiritual consequences. So it is not like promises made for seven lives and that's of course uh, nothing but a play of human sentiments. It's an if if one can do it, it's wonderful. But there is a point of time when the energy of love has faded away. And then one can look after, one can engage uh, with the other person if one is tied in whatever way with a sense of duty, nobility, generosity. But one doesn't give oneself anymore. One can take that self-giving back because it's no more uh, that it's like that is broken. That moment has gone. So it's not like for all times to come. That one has to always understand. That's the sattvic thing. Desh, Kal, Sthan. There was a moment when one, one gave oneself fully. But then as the waters of time flew, for whatever reason, it's not about right, wrong, etc. But things separated. So that self-giving doesn't continue. One doesn't change one's journey because one has given oneself once and for all. That can happen, but to try that is like saying that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> do it under great caution. Beings like Savitri, Satyavan, Rama, Sita, Ruru, they can do it. But then one must be very sure what one is in for. If one can do it, definitely it will have its spiritual rewards. But it's not worth going through that path of pain and struggle and suffering. It's not really necessary. There are stories like that, incidentally. There is a story which I'll just recount where there is this woman. Now these stories have been made with a certain purpose. So there is a woman whose husband is both a leper and, you know, he is a debauch, he drinks, every possible, you can imagine. And yet she loved him unflinchingly. And one day, there is a prophecy that he, he will die next day morning when the sun rises. And she sits on a spiritual dharna that I will not let the sun come out. And as the story goes, Arundhati, the great uh, Tapaswini and Sati, she had to intervene and explain to her, don't misuse her powers and undo the balance of this world and unsettle the balance of the world. So there are things like that which develops. It's a kind of tapasya. There is another example if one thinks that this is too mystic a story. See what happened with Napoleon. Napoleon was a debauch. But deep in his heart, Josephine was his partner. And the day he left Josephine, that was the time of his nemesis. It's historically documented. Swami Vivekananda speaks about it and Shurvindo hints about it. So he was going here, there in hundred things. But Josephine knew and he knew. She is her strength. So there was a bond of love which was like beyond anything that one could imagine. But the day he left that bond, that was the time he crashed. So there are many possibilities which can take place. Uh, so one should not generalize, but by and large, one should lead one's life in a sattvic mode. And self sattvic mode means time, space and causality have to be considered. So if one has given oneself and one sees that uh, it is taking one away from the very strength of the soul, then one can recall the self-giving. That's a much better, simpler way to do it than to take that extreme step like divine has given himself to creation, entered into the darkness. It's very rare that one can do it. If one can do it, it's of course, without a doubt, extremely wonderful. But here I am talking of those who have given themselves, not like forced things, subtly that has to be resisted because that is evil. By giving I mean willfully somebody has given oneself as an act of love, not uh, conscious evil which forces and takes someone forcibly. Yes. Thank you. Prabha, would you want to uh, 
follow up or is the question answered thank you that was that was a very clear beautiful answer thank you very much neha yes uh, my question is what should be done to express the divine mother wow wonderful what should be done to express the divine mother not one thing but a number of things which lead us to that one thing you know what should be done so essentially the one word that we must always remember is sincerity that is the key so we must always see that when i am acting am i acting under my preferences impulsions desires passions or truly trying to express her will in and through me it's a whole lifetime a lifetime sadhana in fact that is the essence of surrender to obey the divine impulsion that's what surrender means surrender means i'll not do anything anymore it means to obey the divine impulsion but that's a long process so that's why nishkam karma equanimity all these prepare us conscious surrender remembrance of the divine aspiration all this prepare us to reach that one point where we say that you move me and i'll be moved by you alone it requires a tremendous sincerity strength and above all grace it actually it's only when the divine accepts fully that such a thing is possible but till then we should cultivate sincerity we should cultivate the spirit of true surrender to the divine we should cultivate the urge to obey the divine but if you ask for one rule then the golden rule has been given by shurbindo and there is no better rule than that and the rule was you know there was a time when ashram was uh, formed so people wanted some rule something as a guideline ashram has hardly any guideline you know <laughs> what rules <laughs> so shirvindo gave one rule or rather he wrote it in a letter which was used as the rule with shirvindo and the mother's permission of course and the rule was known as the golden rule always behave as if the mother is with you do nothing try to think and feel nothing that would contradict her presence that's all that is required as a rule very simple very powerful very difficult to practice always behave as if the divine mother is looking at you because she is indeed present